Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the first annual Green Rights and Warrior Lawyers Virtual Academy. My name's Stepan Wood, if you don't know that already. I'm the director of the Center for Law and the Environment at the Allard School of Law in the University of British Columbia, situated on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people in uh, Vancouver in what is now called Canada. This is the seventh of nine sessions of the Academy, and we are privileged to be joined from Cape Town by the South African Lawyer and Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature Executive Board member Cormac Cullinan. As we get underway, I would invite you to introduce yourselves in the chat and also to uh, turn on cameras so we can all see each other. It's a uh, a fairly small group and um, we'd like to approach this as an interactive conversation more than a, a talking head lecture. Um, Cormac's uh, talk will be followed by commentary by my UBC colleague uh, Kirby Mania, who um, is uh, in the school, school of, now I will forget the whole name, but writing and journalism are in the, uh, in the title. Um, and then Q&A, um, you're welcome to pop questions or comments into the chat at any time. Uh, when it comes to the Q&A uh, period, um, we'll uh, invite you either to put questions in the chat or to uh, unmute yourselves and ask them aloud. Um, when we're done with the Q&A session, uh, the sort of the more formal uh, Q&A session, uh, we'll turn off the recording um, and uh, move into a really completely informal uh, chat around the virtual kitchen table. Um, we had originally planned to do that in a separate Zoom room, uh, but we've found that it's uh, simply easier and uh, more conducive to do to to just stay in the same Zoom room. So. Um, if any of you had registered in advance to uh, go into that um, subsequent informal chat uh, room, you don't need to do that. You can just stay with us here. Um, so I'll now introduce our commentator, who will then in turn introduce our featured warrior lawyer, Cormac uh, Cullinan. Kirby is a lecturer in the School of Journalism, Writing and Media. There you go, that's the proper name. Um, and earned a PhD in English from Witz in Joburg, uh, the University of the Witwatersrand Witwater, in Johannesburg, and holds a Master of Arts in Modern Literature and Culture from the University of York in England. She has taught courses in um, uh, the Environment, Literary Studies, Academic Writing at Universities in South Africa and Canada. Her research focuses on the crossover between urban spaces, literature, and the environment. She's particularly interested in post-apartheid, post-transitional South African literatures, urban ecology, environmental justice, crime writing, post-colonial eco-criticism, and writing pedagogy. Um, and really, it's this combination of the interest with uh, interest in e environmental justice, eco-criticism, uh, literature, and storytelling that I think uh, makes Kirby uh, such a ideal commentator in this um, in this uh, program, which is all about leveraging the power of stories and storytelling um, to shed light on issues of the relationship between law and environmental justice. Recent examples of Kirby's work can be found in the Journal of Commonwealth Literature, Safundi and English Studies in Africa. Thanks so much for agreeing to do this, Kirby, and I will hand it over to you to introduce uh, our featured speaker. Um, thank you so much, uh, Stefan, for uh, inviting me here today. It's such a privilege to be sharing time with you and um, being able to introduce and uh, be in conversation with Cormac Cullinan. So Cormac started his legal career in maritime and international commercial law before specializing in environmental law and governance in 1994, when he established ENACT International in London, an environmental law and policy consultancy firm, which now has offices in Cape Town and Durban. 
Over two decades, Cormac has worked in more than 20 countries, amassing key expertise in environmental law and governance, which includes, amongst many other things, designing the architecture of public and private sector governance systems that promote sustainability, drafting contracts and legal instruments, litigating, advising businesses and social entrepreneurs on greening their enterprises and developing legal compliance systems. Cormac is also an internationally respected author, speaker and advocate for ecological sustainability. And it's at this juncture that I would just like to briefly make mention of his seminal book, first published in 2002, entitled Wild Law, A Manifesto for Earth Justice, which boasts a foreword written by the acclaimed Thomas Berry, the noted theologian, cultural historian, and environmental thinker. In a News 24 article from 2008, Cormac is celebrated for his pioneering work in the field of earth jurisprudence, with wild law widely credited as being the first detailed in-print exploration of this legal philosophy that restores an ecological perspective to governance systems. The same News 24 article goes on to describe wild law as one that argues that because humans cannot exist or flourish except as part of the community of life on Earth, environmental and social crises will continue to worsen unless our legal system compels us to respect the laws of nature and the rights of the other members of the Earth community. In 2008, he was included in Planet Savers, 301 Extraordinary Environmentalists, a book consisting of the who's who in the environmental world, and profiled extraordinary environmentalists in human history. Cormac was listed alongside other notable environmentalists such as Sir David Attenborough, Al Gore and Henry Thoreau. In 2012, he won the Nick Steele Award for the South African Environmentalist of the Year. Cormac has addressed the General Assembly of the United Nations and led the drafting of the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth which was proclaimed in Bolivia in 2010. He is both founder and director of Wild Law Institute, a nonprofit organization that advocates for the rights of nature. And Cormac is also a founder and executive member of GAN, the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature, which is a global network of organizations and individuals committed to respecting and enforcing the rights of nature. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, to listen to Cormac and thank you Cormac for sharing your time. Uh, we're really looking forward to hearing your stories, working at the interface of law, governance and environmental justice. Thank you very much indeed, Kirby. Um, I, I thought I'd just introduce myself with, with a, a, a little bit of a biography. Uh, Kirby's done a, a much more thorough job than I expected. Thank you for that. Um, but seeing that this is about storytelling, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself um, before getting into showing you a few slides to explain uh, some of the work um, before we, we have a, a discussion. So um, I, I thought it might be interesting to, to talk about my own transition as, um, as a lawyer. So I started off um, when I was a young boy, I, I was fortunate enough to grow up on the outskirts of a small town and spent a lot of time you know, wandering around in the forest with, with the dogs and I, I think really got exposed to nature in, in that unsupervised way from an early, early age. And, and I think without realizing it really um, formed a deep bond with, with the natural world at that point. Um, I later went to university and got involved in student politics and the anti-apartheid movement. And that was so intense that um, that dominated my life for a while. And um, when I went to study law, I, I decided that I wanted to become a human rights lawyer because those were the key issues in South Africa at, at the time. Um, I then um, went to join a human rights law firm and they said they were too busy at, at the time to train people properly, go to a big law firm, get training and come back. I kind of did that and um, was about to rejoin them. And then I was offered a job outside of the country in London, um, which was really helpful at the time because white men were conscripted to join the apartheid army and I, I wasn't uh, willing to fight in that army because I've been very involved in the anti-apartheid movement. 
Um, and so I left the country and ended up spending 10 years in London before returning to South Africa. Um, and I, while I was in London, I became an, I did a master's in environmental law and just decided to become a environmental lawyer. Um, and really, the, my decision was very much informed, obviously, by the fact that I love nature, but also by the appreciation that it was human behavior um, that was causing environmental destruction. And it seemed to me that the most powerful tool for regulating human behavior was the law. And that if I could um, become an environmental lawyer and particularly focus on drafting environmental laws or treaties, which would have the maximum um, impact, then the, we could play a role in, in solving the, the problem. And I subsequently, after qualifying, started a consultancy in Act International, as Kirby mentioned. And we did a lot of work um, for the Food and Agriculture Organization, the United Nations, and other um, European Commission, et cetera. So we worked in many countries, often on legislative reform projects. And um, at that stage, I really kind of thought that I was one of the good guys and that I could solve, uh, play a part in solving the world's problems by, by drafting good laws. But I began to encounter problems that I couldn't solve without, with good drafting. And I began to realize that the, the roots of the problem lay far deeper than the text of the legislation. And that, in, in a sense, environmental law was grafted onto a legal system but the main purpose of the legal system was to legitimize the exploitation of, of, of earth. And I guess in short, I realized that you couldn't, so, you couldn't stop environmental harm using just environmental law. That's not to say that environmental law is irrelevant. We would be in a much worse place if it weren't for environmental law. And I, I practice as an environmental lawyer. Um, uh, that's my, my, my day job, as it were. Um, and so I began to, to look and I was searching and eventually got introduced to the great American thinker, um, Thomas Berry, who Kirby mentioned, who had a big influence on me. And, and Thomas said that what we need is a new jurisprudence and he <clears throat> outlined some basic principles of what that should involve. And um, <clears throat> I eventually, in the, but yes, there we go. Great work, Sir Thomas. Uh, spoke very much about the great work of, of our time, about becoming a, a mute for humanity to become a benign presence on earth as opposed to a destructive presence on earth. And um, so Thomas's thinking had a, a great influence on me, and I, I felt that he really gave me the sort of e end of the string, which I could then follow. And I kept expecting somebody to to write about you know this this proposal for a new jurisprudence, and when nobody did. In, you know, I was rash and young, and I just decided to do to to write something, which which is is wild law, um, and that in a way was a kind of a vision about how you could see law and jurisprudence and governance in a very different way, in an ecocentric way. Um, but having written the book, I then um, began to think about how one would get from where we are now in society to a society where wild laws and earth jurisprudence were was applied. Um, and I realized that to make such a profound change in the world, one would need a global movement, one would need an awful lot of people working in concert to make that happen. And so since then, the last, well, actually, to my amazement, it's, it's 20 years this year since I wrote Wild Law. Um, and since, uh, since writing it, I've spent most of my efforts, you know, uh, uh, most of my sort of activism, I can put it that way, I'm working on building a movement to, to take those ideas forward. And that's primarily the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature. So I'll, I'll talk, I'll show a few slides now, which, which will kind of give a sense of, of that work. Um, and then I haven't really delved into the kind of warrior aspect of this. I've, I felt obliged by the title of this to, to consider that. I, I mean, I'm not sure I would, I would normally describe myself as a, as a warrior, but um, you know, I, I had to Google it to see exactly what it meant. Um, but I, you know, certainly, as it's mainly about being an experienced fighter, I think, and, and certainly, you know, I have, I guess, war stories to tell. I mean, I, I'm pre presently being sued for defamation for a million rand by an Australian mining company, and um, regularly attacked um, in other ways by by people. So I think if you do go into this work, this this work, one does need to to be something of. Um, have some qualities of a warrior in the sense that one needs to be 
um, quite steadfast and able to to take um, people attacking you. So that it, it used to surprise me in the beginning because because I was thinking, oh, well, I'm not attacking you. I'm just saying what I think about the world. But I think if you stand up for something strongly, um, uh, it attracts people who disagree with you, and they'll have a go at you whether whether you're looking for a fight or not. So to some extent, that that just goes with the territory. But but we can talk about that later. So I'll just um, show you a couple of, well, a few slides really to explain the, the work, um, which is, I suppose falls under the heading of the, of the green um, rights. Can you see that? Yeah, okay, good. So um, I, I titled it From Human Rights to Earth Rights, A Transformative Path, um, because it's been, for me, it's been a, a, a transformative path, both in terms of my understanding of the law, but also at a, at a very personal level. Um, okay, so I like this picture because to me, it kind of summarizes the, the problem quite neatly. You know, if you have a situation where you have a whole lot of caterpillars consuming the leaf or the, the, the micro environment, if you like, that they depend on for survival, it, it's very easy to see that this is a, not a sustainable situation and that it, it, uh, um, if it were to continue in that way, um, it would end badly for the caterpillars and for the tree. But of course, nature um, doesn't just leave caterpillars as caterpillars and doesn't believe in, in indefinite growth for caterpillars as we do with um, economy economics. So there, there's no GDP for infinite GDP for caterpillars. And what happens is that they transform. And I like this image of a caterpillar transforming into a butterfly because I think it gives a good sense that transformation is about something, a fundamental change in form. Um, um, it, it's not about tweaking. It's not about you know, the, fat, the caterpillars getting a little bit fatter or thinner or longer or shorter. It's about the caterpillars becoming something entirely different, which although those genes were inherent in the caterpillar uh, from the beginning, looking at those caterpillars on the leaf, when if one didn't know about them, you wouldn't think that it was possible for them to turn into a butterfly. And I think that the real issue that faces us is that the dominant cultures in the world um, are living in ways which consume uh, their habitat, like the leaf. And unless uh, cultural transformation occurs, it's going to end badly for, for all of us. And of course, the law um, and governance systems in general are very much part of determining the structure of society. So, so this transformation must, it seems to me, involve a transformation of many things, of worldview, of values, etc., but also a transformation of the structure of society. And currently our societies are based on the mythology of dominance, the idea that human beings are separate from and superior to earth and that it exists as an object for us to, to dominate, um, use as we please um, and manipulate for our, our benefit. But of course it is a mythology, it's not true. Um, what is true is that we are as Thomas um, Berry used to say, we, we really are so integral to Earth that we're more accurately described as an aspect of Earth rather than something distinct from Earth. We are inside the system looking out. We are part of Earth in the most fundamental sense. And um, obviously, we have gases, liquids, foods, nutrients, et cetera, cycling through us on a continual basis, coming, coming from Earth and returning to, to Earth. And it wouldn't be possible for us to survive um, without without that. Um, this is a picture of Thomas and the great work which, which you saw Stefan Heller just now in that book, he says, the great work now as we move into a new millennium is to carry out the transition from a period of human devastation of the earth to a period where humans would be a presence of the planet in a mutually beneficial manner. Now, this is the kind of transition, this transition I believe is, is so fundamental, it's transformative. Um, in much the same way as the transition from a, a caterpillar through, through a chrysalis to, to a butterfly. Um, Thomas also spoke about the, the um, interdependence of every mode of being on every other um, mode of being 
requires humans to recognize that every living being has rights that are derived from existence itself. Otherwise, the ordered structure and functioning of the entire planet are endangered. So he's pointing um, very eloquently to the fact that we are part of a whole and to deny the rest of the, the whole, to deny it has the right to exist, is in a sense denying an aspect of oneself. And um, it, it's um, it, that kind of thinking um, threatens the whole. So I mentioned um, writing Wild Law, um, I, which I wrote after meeting Thomas. Um, it's now been translated into, into many languages in the sec second edition. But Wild Law was, um, writing Wild Law was a very useful exercise for me because um, in a way it allowed me to, to sit and consolidate my ideas and, and to express them. And I'd, I expressed them initially with, with a degree of, of um, I was tentative to, I started writing it and I was finding it very difficult to write because I was working at the same time. And then I realized that the only way I knew how to write was um, the kind of academic writing one does at university with lots of footnotes, et cetera. And I realized I would never get it done that way. So I, I decided that instead of relying on footnotes to um, support um, my views on the basis that you know, other people thought the same way as me, I would just write it on the basis that these are my experiences and this is how I came to these conclusions. And they may or may not be correct. I'm not claiming absolute truth for them. Um, but, but in a way, it was an important transition for me because by this time I had moved from an emphasis on the on the human rights, which I'd been believed in very strongly and was an activist for um, uh, as a student and in my early days, my my um, my professional life, to recognizing that um, we are, if we humans claim the right to exist by virtue of the fact that we are human beings, even if our governments deny that that we have those rights, um, that logic applies to everything that, that, that has come into being. Um, as Leonardo Boff said, all that has come into being has the right to be. And that, and that of course, is also important because each aspect, each member of the, of the community of life we call Earth um, has an important part to play in completing the, the whole um, and, uh, is, and enabling it to function properly. Um, so, the concept of Earth jurisprudence, one can go on for a long time about it, but just to give you a flavor of it, if you haven't come across it, um, some of the principles are that the universe is the primary law given, not human legal system. So when you study law, when I studied law, everything we were told, we, all we needed to know was in the law library. It was, the, it was the, the legislation, it was the cases, and it was what the academics had written about those. Nobody gave any thought to the laws of nature or any, there was no consideration that we are born into an ordered universe and that there was any requirement for us to um, align human activities and human governance systems with, with the systems of order that um, we had been born into. Um, sorry, I think we've gone too far. Um, the, um, then there's, we talk about the rights of nature, that the earth community as a whole and the beings that constitute it have fundamental rights, including the right to exist and to participate in the evolution of the earth community. And the rights of each being are limited by the rights of other beings to the extent necessary to maintain the integrity, balance, and health of the communities within which it, within, within which it, it exists. So these are, the, the concept of rights is, is often quite controversial because, and I, I did think quite carefully about using it when I was writing Wild Law because it comes laden with so many, so much baggage about um, you know, the legal system, et cetera. And certainly when I was taught law, we were taught that if something can't be enforced in a, right, in a court of law, it's not a right. Um, and so it, it, thinking of rights in this way um, it, it is slightly different. But I eventually decided that although it, may, it might be better to talk about interests in the sense that they're less antagonistic, um, if we said we, there were human rights, um, but everything else had interests, the rights would trump the interests and it would defeat the purpose. Um, so I decided that although the term has, um, uh, not without problems, it, were, it, it was necessary to use it within the context of pre-existing legal systems which already recognize rights. Having said that, indigenous legal systems often don't, typically don't use rights and, and often don't even have, uh, many indigenous languages don't have a word for rights even. Um, but in a situation like that, when, when 
one can skip straight to the duties, as it were, because they, they already recognize that they live in an animate universe comprising many different kinds of beings. And so the focus is on the duties of humans. Whereas I think in a, in a legal system which denies that nature has subjectivity, it, using the language of rights immediately raises the question, who's the holder of those rights? Um, and that gets one into the, to the, the deeper discussion of, of beings um, and other than human beings. Um, and, but even so, although rights of nature is the term that gets used very much, the real, really important thing is, is that the rights give rise to corresponding duties on humans. So, you know, whether the river probably doesn't care whether you think it's got rights or not, but the important thing is if, if it does have rights, then uh, humans owe duties to the, to the river. Um, so implementing um, this approach requires, um, it's beyond the, the, this discussion, but I, I just thought I would give you some sense of implementing the, this approach. So I think it, it requires a new overarching purpose for governance systems. Um, which I suggest is harmonious coexistence within the Earth community. So at the moment, most governance systems are designed to facilitate the exploitation of, of Earth. Um, as you may, I hope I'm not boring you, but I often use the example of, of slavery in a situation where we define people as objects, as property that could be bought and sold. It's very clear to see that the slave owner with all the rights um, will exploit the slave whose property and in fact, the system is designed to facilitate that. And that's exactly what has happened um, with, with why the environment gets ex exploited because everything that's not a human being or the state or, or a corporation is defined as an object in the eyes of the law as property um, and uh, it doesn't have rights in it and it gets exploited in the same way. Um, so although environmental laws um, stop perhaps the worst of the harm, they don't address the core, the core issue. It's the objectification and commodification of, of all the beings that with whom we co-evolve. Um, so you need this overarching new purpose for governance systems, I think. Um, and that, of course, is a purpose for the whole legal system, not just for environmental law. Um, you need a statement of beliefs and values to build a social movement around, a process to build a global movement and alliances, means of articulating and disseminating this worldview and ideas, innovation, and the progressive reorientation of all systems um, in society. So I, I'm just quickly put those down just to give you some sense that there is a kind of roadmap here. Um, the Constitution of Ecuador in 2008 provided a, a vision of living well as an overall responsibility, uh, sorry, as an overall um, objective for society. So as you can see, this is very different from uh, promoting GDP growth, which is the, the primary um, objective of most um, certainly Western civilizations. Um, then an important step forward in this was the um, People's World Conference of Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth in, held in Cochabamba, Bolivia in April 2010. Um, this was president of the time, the time Eva Morales convened this, was attended by about 35,000 people. And it, it, what the main impetus was the failure of the Copenhagen climate change talks. And so he said, well, you know, if the governments of the world aren't going to solve this um, problem, let's see what the people have to say. And um, out of this came the, the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth. Um, and that document is really provided a basis for, for unity. It's, a, it's an articulation of the, the basic um, understanding behind Earth, Earth's jurisprudence, if you like. And the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth is kind of a, intended as a kind of companion piece to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It wraps around it, if you like, because Universal Declaration of Human Rights is really a species-specific articulation of rights, um, whereas this is, is the wider articulation of rights and um, um, in a way the fundamental rights. With, and then on top of that, you may have different and, and more specific rights for different species. Um, but once we had this Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth, it, it gave us a platform um, for building a movement around a unifying manifesto, if you like. Um, and later that year, the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature was formed um, at the foot of this um, magnificent volcano, Tungurawa, in, in, um, uh, in Ecuador. Um, and now, this is a, from the website of, of Gone, 
It's a global network of organizations and individuals committed to the recognition of the rights of nature um, and uh, um, to the universal adoption and implementation of legal systems and recognize, respect, and enforce rights of na nature. So there's lots more information on that website if you want to, to find out about it. Um, innovation, I mentioned, is one of the important aspects. One of the most innovative things I think that the Global Alliance has done is to establish an international tribunal for the rights of nature, which holds hearings um, to investigate, to decide whether um, there have been infringements of the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother, Mother Earth. And it creates events um, which uh, are followed by journalists and enables communities to, to stand on an international platform and tell their stories and has been very effective. So I see it as a kind of a prototype of the kind of international and national um, institutions that we're going to need in the future if we want to have ecologically sustainable societies. Um, another example of innovation is we're recently working on a, on a declaration for Antarctica. So the idea is um, that, it's, you know, Antarctica is one of the few places in the world where the colonial project was never completed. So people rushed down and claimed, stuck their flags in and claimed as a slice of the pie. Um, but it was frozen, sorry, the claim, uh, the process of, of claiming the territory was frozen by the Antarctic Treaty. And um, now there's, it, it, it occupies a rather unusual place in international affairs, but it's, it's the most enormous area. Um, if you include the, the ecosystems around it within the Antarctic convergence, the upwelling of, of, of cold ocean waters, it, it covers approximately 10% 10, uh, 10 of the globe or 20% of the Southern hemisphere. And so the idea of this is why shouldn't Antarctica be sovereign unto itself? Why, why does it need people? Um, why shouldn't it be the equivalent of a, a country and that we, we visit it, that maybe we can have ambassadors to um, uh, Antarctica, but we shouldn't have governors for Antarctica. And, and of course, Antarctica, the primary threat to the Antarctic system is, is climate change. And if we had, if it were recognized as a legal person in that way, it would be wonderful to be able to stand up in a, in a court in, in Washington or Paris or London and say, I represent Antarctica and I'm making the case for what you, why what you're doing is, is infringing the rights of my um, client. Now, obviously this is something which is, which is there'd be huge resistance to, but I give it as an example of the kind of uh, disruptive power of innovative thinking. Um, and this is something which is not catered for in the international um, legal regime, but ought to be. Um, so for example, there's some of the, we, the draft hasn't been completed, but this gives you some ad, idea of the kinds of things that, that such a declaration um, might include. Um, the United Nations Harmony with Nature program, which has a website with lots of um, important information on it, has been another important part of the, this program. And um, it really traps, it tracks um, developments around the world in implementing rights of nature and um, the Earth jurisprudence approach. Um, and the, um, when we started the Global Alliance um, more than 12 years ago, we had this idea that, that we should, uh, that the rights of nature was, was an idea whose time had come. But I think it was more aspirational at that time. And um, certainly, but I think through the work of the Global Alliance and, and many other um, people who participated, that time has actually come now. I've just returned from a meeting um, in uh, Siena, a global gathering of, of, a, of the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature, and, and Lisa, who I see here, was also, also there. And, um, you know, I think what was palpably different was that, that now this movement has got great internal momentum and is moving very, very fast. There were people from more than 22 countries there, all kinds of initiatives, that I, some of which I'd never heard of. Um, just before we arrived there, um, the uh, Mar Menor, a saltwater lagoon in Spain, was declared to be a legal person. And the people who did that achieve that were, were there. So it's a very exciting time to see this uh, huge change in uh, legal systems actually beginning to happen. And you can find some more information. These websites, the first is the Wild Law Institute, which which I'm the, the director of. Um, there's the Global Alliance, the African Hub, the Global Garden itself, and the Harmony with Nature um, at the United Nations. Um, 
but let me let me stop there and um we can deal with the rest in discussion thank you um thank thank you so much cormac um for such an insightful talk uh, and I do invite our audience members to join me in a virtual round of applause. Um, thank you, so, thank you so much, Cormac. Um, so I, I've been asked to uh, respond to that talk and was lucky enough to have a, a copy of Cormac's slides in advance, and it helped to shape the kinds of things that I'd like to talk about uh, in in response to um, in response to that uh, presentation. Um, and I really wanted to hone in on Thomas Berry. Um, who is cited twice in Cormac's talk. And so I looked into his essay, The New Story, and I'd like to share an excerpt with you that helps to thread a through line through Cormac's important work, as well as the Academy's focus on warrior lawyers and the power of storytelling, which has the intention to bring the relationship between law, environmental rights, and environmental justice to life. So Barry writes, it's a question of story. We are in trouble just now because we do not have a good story. We are between stories. The old story, the account of how the world came to be and how we fit into it is not functioning properly and we have not learned the new story. So this was written in 1978 um, and Barry writes that the new story needs to herald a transition to a more holistic relationship with the functioning of the natural world. Uh, this relationship needs to be built on an intimate communion with the larger human community and with the cosmic earth process. We see this coming through uh, very trenchantly in Cormac's talk about this interrelatedness um, of rights with the, within the earth community. So the new stories Barry's essay points to need to challenge this old story, a story that was inherently and brutally anthropocentric and extractive. So stories are powerful symbols because it is in and it is through stories that we make sense of the world around us. I roll within it as well as conceive of our purpose, our responsibilities and accountability to others. What Cormac thinks about in terms of not just our rights and entitlements, but rather our duties uh, to, the, to the resources that we share and hold in common. Um, and this accountability is to not just other human beings in our community, but all other non-human life. Stories themselves are, are representational forms. They frame ideas and ideologies and they shoulder symbol and myth. And our past stories, as Barry notes, have been destructive. They no longer serve us. So we're in need of a new story or new stories. Uh, to borrow from Cormac's title, we need a transformative path. And law and narrative share many similarities. Law is the story we collectively endorse as a narrative structure to help society function. And so a new story, which embraces indigenous ways of knowing, is reflected in the Ecuadorian constitution of 2008, which Cormac spoke about. Um, and it confers legal standing to the environment, not seeing the uh, environment as, as property, but affording it subjectivity. And I think it's really interesting because it enshrines traditional ecological knowledge uh, through the Andean Quechua people's worldview of Sumac Kause, um, which uh, 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 Cormac translated for us as um, Buen Vivir, which means the good living. And this is, is a concept or a story um, that points to a way of life that is sustainable, community focused and ecologically balanced. So this is not just a story putting forward different values that are more ecocentric instead of anthropocentric and valuing the space that is around us quite differently. But I wanted to emphasize how much this different worldview encourages, encourages or invites us to think about time differently. So slowing down, focusing on the communities around us, emphasizing connection and interaction with each other, as well as this communion with nature. So it's not so much of a surprise that advocates of degrowth, uh, economic degrowth, state that in moving away from our current voracious growth models uh, that are focused on extractive resource and fossil fuel industries, we need to really slow down and appreciate time as a precious commodity. And so this new story of time can be a way to rediscover our role in society, to be more considerate to each other, more civically active, 
and more caring to both human and non-human others. And Cormac spoke about the fact that um, when the Global Alliance was created, uh, it was aspirational at the time, whereas now uh, the Global Alliance is timely. It is of the time. This is important. It's impressing. Um, it's pressing that we need to look at. Uh, in writing for Greenpeace, I'm Rekha Sharma in an essay titled Storytelling and the Work of Justice similarly observes that storytelling, like the work of justice, is also about power because it is about making conscious choices, which characters are centered, whose fate matters and what they are up against, who is the narrator, what points of view will be included, how the central conflict or problem is named and framed and what events are included or excluded uh, will cue what solutions are likely. So when we're thinking about this new story and what it constitutes, I think we have to uh, self-reflect and ask ourselves a number of key questions is, so who tells this new story and to whom must we listen? And environmental justice is pr predominantly about uh, looking at indigenous ways of knowing and, and understanding that climate change is, is affecting uh, marginalized and vulnerable communities as we speak much more um, uh, disproportionately uh, than more affluent, uh, affluent communities. And what content needs to form the narrative bedrock of the story? So stories and narrative are fundamentally modes of representation and thinking about what kinds of representational tools are needed to tell these new stories um, to advance uh, the narrative of environmental justice calls uh, to mind for me, Robert Nixon's uh, book and his concept, Slow Violence. And he talks about the necessity of finding ways to infuse the slow violence of environmental disaster and climate change with an urgent visibility. And he emphasizes the need to devise arresting stories, images and symbols uh, it's adequate to the pervasive but elusive violence of delayed environmental effects. And I'm gonna share um, a quote from Nixon here, which I think is really interesting and ties very uh, uh, poignantly into the discussion we're having today. Uh, Nixon says, politically and emotionally, different kinds of disasters possess unequal heft. Falling bodies, burning towers have a visceral, eye-catching and page-turning power that tales of slow violence that unfold over years, decades, even centuries cannot match. Stories of toxic buildup, massing greenhouse gases and accelerated species loss due to ravaged habitats are all cataclysmic but they are scientifically convoluted catalysms in which casualties are postponed, often for generations. In an age when the media venerate the spectacular, when public policy is shaped primarily around perceived immediate need, a central question is strategic and representational. How can we convert into image and narrative the disasters that are slow moving and long in the making, disasters that are anonymous and that star nobody, disasters that are attritional and of indifferent interest to the sensation-driven technologies of our image-based world? How can we turn the long emergencies of slow violence into stories dramatic enough to rouse public sentiment and warrant political intervention? Um, these emergencies whose repercussions have given rise to some of the most critical challenges of our time. So what Nixon does in his book is he turns to exploring strategies of what he calls writer activists. And he argues that these writer activists are able to give this dramatic visibility to environmental crises. And they do so through using compelling community-based narratives uh, and alliances and use the power of personal storytelling to redefine speed, uh, to counter the perceived slow violence of environmental degradation. And they turn this, this damage into uh, something that is visible, tangible, and is a call to action. He mentions Rachel Carson's Silent Spring as an excellent case in point uh, that helped to narrativize the environmental harm caused by pesticides and credits its potency in telling the complicated story, um, but that was dramatic enough to rouse public sentiments. 
And so I'm thinking now of Nixon's book that was published in 2011, but I'd like us to turn our attention perhaps in maybe our discussion and put some questions um, to Cormac about this, is uh, the more radical set of climate justice activists and the more radicalization of the climate movement uh, who are telling dramatic stories in the kind of sense of, of, of um, responding to Nixon's call uh, of ha habitat and biodiversity loss, global warming, sea level rise, and toxic uh, hazards, as well as these unequal disproportionate effects of environmental injustice. So I'm thinking here of uh, movements like Just Stop Oil, uh, Extinction Rebellion, and Canada's own Save Old Growth, which are fighting against uh, old growth logging in Ferry Creek on Vancouver Island. And they these groups come to mind because they're finding ways to tell this new story through their activism, which is infused with the sense of urgency, um, redefining the, the, the pace of the story we tell of environmental degradation. Um, and they are capitalizing on code switching. They're using unfamiliar contexts as new stages for this conversation. So the throwing of soup on masterpieces, the blocking access, the installing of blockades on major arterial routes. And so these stories are currently making us feel uncomfortable and forcing us to rethink what Thomas Berry spoke of as the old story. Um, and they're requiring us to move away from exploitation towards what Cormac was, was emphasizing in his talk as the collaborative participation and building communities of care in a global movement in order um, to be inclusive of all lives um, uh, in the earth community. All right, thank you. Thank you, Kirby. Uh, Cormac, would you like to say anything in, re in response? Um, I don't have a lot to say in response to Kirby. I really enjoyed what you had to say, though. Um, I, I found that um, really interesting. And I do, of course, agree completely with, with what you're saying, that, that um, stories are so important in, in shaping people's worldview and, and also shifting the imagination to, to new worldviews um, and, and that they are critically important. And, um, I realized while you were talking that that if one attends, for example, one of the hearings of, of, of the International Rights of Nature Tribunal, it I hadn't thought about it this way before, but it is an example of, of that kind of narrative because typically we would start um, the evidence is led by an, a, an earth defender or earth prosecutor. So instead of having the public prosecutor, this is the person who's representing Mother Earth and would call first expert evidence that would explain the issue, whether it's deforestation or fracking or whatever. Um, so it's laid out. And then we always call people who are directly witnesses who can attest from their own experience, for example, what it's like to live in, in land that's been heavily fracked, what it's like to, to live next to a river that's terribly polluted, et cetera. And these testimonies are so powerful that it's not uncommon to see people in the audience in tears. Um, and, uh, and it is quite a dramatic reenactment. Re and, and also we are able to pull together things, for example, we can have a case Although the Amazon spreads over many nations, we can have a case which looks at the Amazon forest as a single living being um, and, and, and looks holistically at what's, ha what's happening, happening to it. And so in that way, um, uh, makes visible, perhaps for an audience in, in London or Glasgow or somewhere like that, um, an, an, an entity which is seen in, normally seen in sort of, um, I shall say quite mechanistic terms, we're losing so many football fields of, of forest a, a year. And it, 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 but, but to see the Amazon as a being, to encounter, to encounter her as one of the most awesome creatures or, or, or communities of life on the planet and, and to see it happening is, is, is a way of creating and bringing, in, bringing into the room um, a, new, a new way of seeing. But I really like what you had to say, Kirby, and I, and I do agree. And I, I also am in a, I, I, I do agree with, with, with activism. Um, the, only, the only thing that sometimes worries me is, is a little bit is that, you know, having, I suppose, becoming grown up as an activist in the anti-apartheid movement, I am a strong believer in organization that one can't simply have just events. One has to establish, a, you know, a stru structures of organizations and collaboration, et cetera, which can survive repression over time and carry forward these things. But I, 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 it's not a disagreement with you. I just sometimes think that there's a temptation to, to forget that when, when uh, you know, uh, focusing on, on a 
and events, but both are important. And I'm happy to 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 chat. I see there was a question in the in the chat from Frida. Um, should I just speak that or wait for Frida to speak? It? I don't know if you want to ask me directly. Yeah, Frida, you're welcome to uh, to ask your question, or you can just let uh, Cormac answer it based on what you've written in the chat. Why don't you um, just go ahead then, Cormac? Okay. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, Frida asked a very uh, a very interesting question, and what one which which rises um, repeatedly and. Um, so, and, and very much in my own country, among others, um, uh, you know, so typically you, ha you have a situation where um, developing countries in the South are very much dependent, as she says, on um, mining, oil, gas, that kind of thing. Um, and, um, but also typically have a lot of people who are directly reliant on, on nature, who may perhaps get, you know, food from nature, medicines, et, et cetera. And recently I've been involved in a case here in South Africa where, um, against Shell. Um, so Shell was what conducting offshore, what wanted to conduct offshore seismic um, tests off an area of South Africa known as the Wild Coast, a very beautiful wild area. And the people who live there uh, on the shore um, are live in fairly traditional um, lives. And I've also, um, I'd also uh, represented some of those communities over a period of a decade or so. So I knew the area well. And um, so the arguments were, were partially about um, to what extent will the, the seismic testing um, have a negative effect on marine life, like for example, whales migrating through the area, penguins, and um, even plankton. Um, um, but a significant part of the case that, that was brought in was these communities um, saying that they had cultural beliefs, that their ancestors live in the ocean and that they shouldn't be disturbed. And if you you're going to do something like that, there would have to be all kinds of rituals and ceremonies to placate their ancestors. And there were a lot of cultural beliefs around the sea and they weren't consulted at, at all in, the, in this process. Um, and then you had other people saying, well, um, some of the arguments that we were advancing, for example, on behalf of Greenpeace Africa was, was that, you know, we can't, we can only burn a tiny percentage of the proven oil and gas reserves in the world without um, exceeding the Paris Agreement targets. So there's no point in looking for more. Um, uh, but then there are other people saying, yes, but we're a developing country and why don't we, if we had our own oil and gas, we wouldn't have to buy it from other countries, et, et, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the whole question of the right, as it were, of, of poorer countries to, to exploit um, minerals and, and, and oil and gas um, is a very real thing, particularly because, I mean, some, of course, it depends. Sometimes the money is still stolen by by politicians or, or, or taken out of the country, but sometimes it is also used for social programs. Um, and um, th there's a very real issue there. And of course, developing countries are fond of saying, well, you know, Europe, the industrial revolution, et cetera, was built of coal and et cetera. And now, now you want to stop us doing that. But I think that whatever the injustices, the social injustices of the situation, the fact is that like that first slide of, of the, the caterpillars on the leaf is that we have to stop this. I mean, we uh, humanity on this planet. We we not only have to stop burning fossil fuels. We have to we have to sequestrate some of the fossil fuel, some of the greenhouse gases that have already, already been emitted. There's already too much carbon up there, um, and that's an extraordinarily difficult task to do. And I, I don't think we have the luxury of um, of of not recognizing the reality that we are a part of, of the whole in much the same way as, as the cell in, in a body depends for its existence and well-being on the health of the, of the whole body. So although there are genuine and perhaps legitimate stories about the injustices between the global, well, not, there definitely are injustices between the global north and, and, and the global south, um, I think that um, we, developing countries um, have to accept the reality that um, the, the, the fossil fuel train is heading towards disaster and you oughtn't to fight to stay on that train. You, the sooner you get off on that train and get on a train going in another direction, the better. Um, and so that I, I do feel that, that the, the efforts to, to carry on on that form of development, on that, that path of towards so-called civilization 
is misplaced um, and that, um, that developing countries need to stop oil and gas as much as developed countries. Oh, go ahead. That must be Avery with the hand raised. <laughs> Uh, I apologize for my camera not being on. I've had a lot of bandwidth issues um, with my internet right now. And so this helps with um, keeping the audio running smoothly. Uh, so Cormac, thank you so much for your talk. And, and Kirby, thank you so much for your commentary. I have like six different articles that I have written down to read now. Um, something I run into, like a barrier I run into when I think about the rights of nature movement and environmentalism more largely is how politicized it's become in a lot of countries, at least in Canada. So um, while people may in principle, you know, love nature or respect nature or um, agree that it's important in some respect, they also, they also seem to think that environmentalism is limited to, you know, all these, it, to like the progressive side of the political spectrum or that if you, you know, align with environmentalist ideas that you are, you are automatically, you know, affiliated with all these other things. And um, especially in Canada, which is a, like a petro state almost, you know, like you are seen as anti-economic growth or, or anti, you, you're against the livelihoods of so many Canadians, essentially. And I was just wondering how you go about navigating that kind of a discussion when it becomes politically charged and you ne didn't necessarily intend it to be um, at the start. Yeah, it, it, it's a great question. I, I must admit, I, I was speaking earlier in the week on, online to a, a conservation symposium. Sorry, it was last week, it was a conservation symposium in, in South Africa, um, but conservationists fall over. And there were some of them that, were, that you know, seemed to take offense at the idea of, of rights of nature. And I, I just found it curious that if you're a conservationist, that you'd object to having, to nature having the right to exist. You know, as I sometimes say to people, we are we humans are but one leaf on the on the tree of life, and um, we claim to have all the rights. We don't recognize that the branches or the tree or its roots have the right to exist, but we want to have our rights. We're, it's so obvious that you know that our human rights are meaningless if the tree doesn't have the right to exist. Um, um, but I know what you mean, and, and and look, I mean, if one looks at what's happened in, in the United States, where the climate change became politicized, I mean, on a party political basis, and you could see the shift suddenly to be a good Republican, you had to be a climate change denier. Um, I mean, it, it's it's very regrettable. It's stupid. Um, um, you know, you're just kidding yourself. You're kidding yourself. Um, if you choose to, ch to switch off your, your um, discriminatory or intellectual faculties out of loyalty to your political party, well, that, you know, where that road leads. Um, and so, I think it's very unfortunate. I, I try, I try not to. Um, I, I try not to make the. I try to avoid being pegged in a left right um, uh, spectrum. I mean, I, I suppose my my activism background, you know, would is I would see myself as being on the left, um, but I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I don't think it's particularly helpful um, to 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 peg this kind of approach on a, on a left right. Um, Kind of um, spectrum, and and certainly there are a lot of people who who may be politically conservative, but but you know are very in favor of, of protecting nature, etc. So my I guess my my response is to is to try and avoid it, saying that it's you know you, this is not about understanding things, not try, about trying to locate it on a on a left right spectrum. But the other thing that I, I often say to people is that. I'm not making an ideological argument. I mean, it, in my view, um, the existing uh, governance systems are based on completely demonstrably false assumptions. Um, they're based on uh, ideas that came out of the age of enlightenment in 16th, 17th century Europe that, that, that universes mechanism and, and, it, and it works like a giant clock. Now, if that were the case, it would make sense that humans were subject and the rest were, were the object because it's mechanism. Um, but that view was abandoned by science an awful long time ago, but it still persists in the, the legal system. So it's a bit like, you know, when, when, when Galileo and Copernicus said, uh, we think that actually um, the sun isn't going around the earth and the earth's going around the sun. They didn't convince the authorities at the time. You know, the church made Galileo recant. Um, but 
because the one was true and the other wasn't true, um, over time, everybody defected to the reality that the, the Earth moves around the sun. And the, the reality is that we humans are not uh, um, separate from or superior to, to Earth, and that our well being is entirely derived from, from the Earth. And you can choose to take uh, a, a position against that. But in my, in my view, the, the choice is not between two competing ideologies, it's between delusion and, if not reality, a better version of reality. Um, and so it, it's people often misconceive this. What we're talking about is a fundamental shift in paradigm. It's not just two competing ideologies within the same paradigm, like, you know, sort of capitalism versus communism. I'm going to jump in here at this uh, juncture um, to bring the formal, um, you know, recorded portion of the event to a close and then invite everybody who wishes to stick around for uh, intimate chat at the kitchen table, uh, the virtual kitchen table. Uh, before I do that, I just want to give a reminder to folks that the Green Rights and Warrior Lawyers Academy is not over with this session. We have two more sessions coming up today, um, starting in just under an hour. Uh, we are going to be joined uh, uh, by the Nigerian environmental lawyer and activist um, and uh, 2022 Goldman Prize winner, Chima Williams. Uh, and then two hours after that, our final session for this year will be with uh, the Maori legal scholar Jacinta Ruru, who has been a leading figure in the movement for and thoughtful reflection on legal personhood for um, natural uh, features in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, so please uh, join us for those. You can still register at the website um, that you went to to register for this talk. And please uh, also, it's not too late for any university students you know uh, to join into our innovative uh, companion uh, activity or event, the Green Rights and Warrior Lawyers Inspirathon, which is open to university students around the world to enter in teams to work on um, advancing um, uh, proposals on a, a campaign uh, spearheaded by one of our other featured speakers, the uh, Philippine uh, lawyer uh, extraordinaire and storyteller, Tony Opoza. And that is a project to convert unsustainably exploited exclusive economic zones into sustainably stewarded enlightened ecosystem zones around the world. Um, so details about that can be found at the same uh, website and do encourage university students that you know um, to join in. They could be undergraduate or postgraduate. Um, at this point, um, I will um, ask Avery to stop the recording. <laughs>